Hey folks, this week I'm in Washington, D.C. at the American Society for Microbiology's annual microbe conference. Earlier today, I was lucky enough to receive the inaugural ASM Microbiome Data Prize. I was so proud to receive it. This prize was also sponsored by the National Microbiome Data Con Collaboration, the NMDC. Uh, they do a lot of great work to encourage folks to release their data, make their data publicly accessible. But more than that, they really put in a lot of great effort to helping people think about metadata and how we can add more value to our sequence data and other type of data that we generate in microbiome, but also more generally. So I hope you enjoy this talk. And uh, again, thanks for all the well wishes that I've received and uh, really appreciate the support for our efforts to engage in open research. Thank you very much to the organizers and the MDC and ASM. Uh, it is a great honor to me uh, to receive this award. Um, I, I hope I'm not reading too much into it, but it's a particular honor to be the first recipient of this. Um, those of you that engage in op doing open science, sometimes you wonder if you're fighting the battle that's not worth fighting. And so receiving awards like this really, really does make it worth it and um, is a good indicator that uh, to our trainees that this stuff is important. So thank you very much. Question that I want to ask you all to motivate the rest of my talk. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with a guy named Simon Sinek, but has a book and probably TED Talks out the out your ears that that's basically asks you to start with why. So why do you do science, right? And so don't I don't want to know. Um, but if you're if you're like me, when I answer this question, I do science because I am on a search for truth. I want to know how the world is put together. Um, how things work, and, and I think the world is beautiful, right? And I want to understand how that beauty translates into ways that we can help each other and how we can help the environment, right? But to do that, I can't do it on my own, right? I have to build upon the work of others. I have to stand on their shoulders so I can see further. And I know then that I have a responsibility that others have to be able to stand on my shoulders, right? So I need to make broad shoulders. I need to try to be tall, so to speak, right? Maybe we can push this metaphor a little too far, but we all build upon each other. And if you're doing closed science, if you're making everything proprietary, saying the data are mine, they're not yours, then you're really narrowing your shoulders, right? You're making it harder for others to stand on your shoulders and to help us to see further. We have big problems. I don't know if you've noticed that over the last couple of years, but we have big problems. And science, I think, is at the heart of, of solving those problems. So I've got a number of reasons, and this is a very partial list for why I think open science is important. I'm going to spend a few slides talking generally about uh, each of these points. So I think open science is important for the rapid release of information. I'll start with a picture here on the right. Um, so three years ago, when I think we were in San Francisco, I was walking around with just a huge weight on my shoulders because I had just been diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I had, hadn't told anybody, and it would be a few more months till I would tell anybody, and it was just this just huge burden on me uh, because what would it do to my family? And so the next week, my wife and I went to go see our oncologist and she brought in this conference abstract that had not been peer reviewed and had this single figure on it, okay? And my doctor said, and I looked at it and like, okay, that's a survival curve. I don't know what all those abbreviations mean, but the red line and the black line that you can see kind of tracing each other, the red line is radiation alone and the black line is radiation plus chemotherapy. And she said, based on this 20 year study that was just presented at a conference without peer review, I don't think you need chemotherapy, okay? For the type of cancer I had, right? So this impacted my life dramatically, right? It meant that I could go into the pandemic without having to recover from chemo, right? And it meant that my family wouldn't be so burdened. Um, and so releasing data affects people. And, and if you haven't noticed, right, there is a pandemic going around, right? And so the availability of preprints and open access publications um, is, is all instrumental in getting information out to our colleagues, right? Imagine where we'd be with a vaccine or therapies if all these scientists hadn't been releasing their genome sequences, right? We would be just in a horrible position, right? And I'm not saying that preprints have solved all the problems. Sure, they probably caused some problems, um, but I think it certainly helps to move science forward and really allows us to build upon each other. And we also need to think about this idea of developing these community resources like sequence data and like the great microbiome data that we've been working with. I also think it's important for reproducibility and replicability. When we do a project in my lab, we always start with the last project as our starting point, right? And I think that's kind of what we all do in a way. 
But I want to see that people in my lab and myself can recreate the last result we had, because then we want to build upon that, right? So if we develop a new tool, well, we want to see what the people did previously. And we want to validate it using their data because we don't want to, you know, do a bait and switch and make their program look worse with a different data set. But we want to be able to reproduce what they've done. And so this table comes from a paper that I published in MBio a few years ago, talking about reproducibility, replicability, robustness, and generalizability. And so um, we can think about same methods, but we can also think about same data. Or, or I'm sorry, same methods. And, and going across, we can think about different data, right? So same data or different data. Right, so I can look at the biomarkers for colon cancer in my cohort, but I could, and so that would be reproducibility, right? And then I could look at other cohorts, and that would help with replicability, right? And so then as we as use different methods, different angles of looking at the problem, we can think about robustness and generalizability. But that all starts with getting the data, right? To expect me to generate data for multiple cohorts worth of samples it's just a waste, right? It's just ridiculous. And that would be tremendously selfish uh, for people to not share the data because then that slows our progress forward. And of course, none of us have all the good ideas, right? Like you all are smart, you're here after all, right? Um, but, but we don't have, none of us each have the good ideas. And so ways that we've thought about this in my lab is, as I've mentioned, benchmarking new methods and the ability to benchmark those methods with diverse data sets. I'll talk more about that here in a few moments. We come up, we're constantly coming up with new analytical methods, right? And so being able to get access to previous data sets or previous samples is really important and something that I've been dependent on using samples for biomarker studies that the PIs had no idea what the human microbiome was. But because we had a new strategy, we could go after those. And then of course, we all have new questions, right? Questions that the original investigators could not have foreseen. I think open data is also really important because huge, huge investments have been made for every paper that gets published, right? We talk about the kind of out of control article publication costs just to publish a paper of a few thousand dollars. Well, if you look at NIH funding and the number of papers that come out of each NIH grant, consider things like indirect costs, it's about a quarter of a million dollars for a paper to get published, right? When you consider personnel money, reagents, getting samples, sequencing, publishing, right? That is not cheap, right? And so um, beyond the financial costs, there's also intangible costs. So again, if I go out and I recruit a cohort of people with and without colon cancer, I'm going to go up to people that have just figured out they have colon cancer, right? So how many times do you think we want to do that to those people, right? We want to minimize that as much as possible. Um, also, uh, we have, we're working in environments that I would consider kind of scientifically sacred. So whenever I see somebody's gone off to the beautiful Galapagos Islands, I wonder, does the Galapagos Islands need another person traipsing around screwing up that environment? Probably not, right? So we need to be efficient with the data that we use from these scientifically sacred sites. And I think what this also comes back to is what does a published paper represent, right? Do you see the papers that you publish as the final answer on whatever you are studying? And so if you think that, <laughs> then I, I don't know, I think maybe you need to drop your perspective a little bit. Because really, we're all on a step, right, towards something next. And even Nobel Prize winning science is a step to something more, right? And so what, what our papers, I think, represent is an advertisement, an advertisement for our ideas, for our data, for our methods, for our reagents, for our tools, right? And so if we think of our paper as an advertisement, well, I want to sell my ideas, right? I want people to read my papers. I want people to use my data. Um, and so we really need to get out of this proprietary framework that I've published this paper, you don't have rights or access to the data or methods in those papers, that, it, that it's mine, right? So needless to say, not everyone agrees with this, um, and including uh, the editors of the New England Journal of Medicine, who a few years back wrote this editorial on data sharing. And this is like one of the things that Twitter just loves to go nuts about, um, that... Um, in here, they have a quote. Uh, there is a concern among some frontline researchers that the system will be taken over by what some researchers have characterized as research parasites. So I, I know people use words loosely, but I consider myself a microbial ecologist. And a parasite is an organism that benefits at the expense of something else, right? So it's a positive-negative relationship. So, 
if I make my data available to you, does that hurt me? <laughs> no, right? That helps me. That helps me with citations. Again, that helps me to get my ideas out, right? It's a mutualistic interaction, not parasitism. Uh, needless to say, they, this kind of blew up on them. I don't know how much they've retracted, but um, it did give rise to another type of award called the Parasite Awards, um, celebrating rigorous secondary data analysis, um, which I think is just the, the appropriate response to claims of data parasitism. And one of the awardees of this is Julie dunning hutop who's an outstanding microbiologist um, at the University of Maryland. And she has a series of work that I absolutely love where she basically takes throwaway data and reanalyzes it. So in this study that was published in PLOS Computational Biology, she took uh, cancer genome sequence data, and instead of throwing away the bacterial DNA as a contaminant, she included that in her assembly. And lo and behold, the bacterial DNA assembled with the human DNA, primarily uh, in the chromosomal DNA. And if you haven't looked at her studies, they're fascinating. Uh, there's another where they find entire chromosomes of Wolbachia in Drosophila genomes. And then they go back and they do further studies, of course, not just sequence analysis, to biologically show that this is the case and think about mechanisms, right? So the data that, that they're borrowing, again, is a case where the original PIs, the authors, had no concept because of their expertise, right? But Julie is interested in bacterial genomics, horizontal gene transfer, evolution, host microbe interactions. And so she sees the world differently than the oncologists, right? And so uh, this is one example of, of many. Um, of course, within our own microbiome field, this is, I think, a fairly popular editorial at this point. Uh, available upon request is not good enough. This is an editorial that basically is a takedown of a European study that published thousands, data from thousands of samples that they then kept behind a paywall uh, and would make PIs jump through tons of hoops to use. I've never used this data set because I can't get access to it. So if I can't get access to that data set, I'm not going to cite their work, right? And so um, what, what others have found is that when authors say available upon request, it's almost like you don't need a study to do this because we've probably all emailed an author for data, that 93% of the authors who say data available re upon request do not provide the data to the person asking for it, right? So this is just a non-starter. So what are we talking about in terms of scientific data? So the NIH um, has instituted a policy that any proposal submitted after January of 2023, so seven months or so, um, that, all their, that PIs have to have a plan for data management and sharing. And they define data as this, that the recorded factual material commonly accepted in the scientific community as of sufficient quality to validate and replicate research findings regardless of whether the data are used to support scholarly publications. Right? So I think this is a really ambitious definition. Uh, as someone that's received this prize now, uh, perhaps I shouldn't admit this, but that last clause, regardless of whether the data are used to support scholarly publication, I'm not there yet, right? I need to improve. I need to get to the point where we're submitting our data, even if it doesn't go to a publication, right? We all have the best of plans to publish something. Um, perhaps it turns out to be a negative result, and those, you know, get pushed down a little bit further in terms of our data release. But we need to do a better job of, of getting all the data accessible. And I, I'm proud to say that within ASM's journals, uh, Microbiology Resource Announcements is very happy to publish data so that people can get citations for that, even if it's a negative result. In fact, you're not even allowed to describe results for a Microbiology Resource Announcements paper. Within ASM journals, we have a data release policy um, where we say that it's expected that this data will be released to the public no later than the publication date of the final article I would prefer to see this at the time of submission, because then we can put the enforcement of this on the reviewers and editors, rather than the editorial staff, who doesn't have the domain level expertise to go through and, and kind of make sure that you know, your accession numbers link up and everything, and make sure that the, all the data is actually there. So in my closing moments, I want to talk about the, the efforts that my lab has taken to both um, promote open science as well as benefit from open science. So a number of years ago, um, the SRA was a royal pain in the rear for uploading data to. And I think it probably still is, but I don't realize that because we put a really cool function within our mother software package called make.sra that basically streamlines the uploading of the data using MIMARC's data package standards. And we did this in collaboration with the folks at SRA. 
and um, they were only too happy to help us do this. Since then, we've also created tools in Mother so that you can directly download and use the SRA formatted sequence data. And so that's a tool that, that we have in Mother and many have benefited from. Also because I recognize we're bringing a lot of people in from other fields into the microbiome world that there's a lot of training that needs to happen. And so over the years, I've created a set of resources at rifamonas.org. Um, I have a, a long tutorial series on reproducible research that has a heavy emphasis on data accessibility and data availability. And if you look at uh, the numerous YouTube videos that I've been making about uh, reproducible data analysis, you'll see in there that we're also using a lot of open data sets to promote reuse of data. So I also find that these um, data, data being available is tremendously useful for benchmarking new methods. So this is a figure from a preprint that will hopefully be published later this year, looking at the effect of removing rare sequences from your community analysis and what effect that has on downstream processing, right? And so in these um, simulations, we use data from 12 different types of communities and imposed an effect size. And basically what I was able to show was that as you remove basically like singletons, doubletons, and rare sequences, you lose statistical power to detect differences between different treatment groups, right? And so, but what you can see is that by using 12 different data sets, it's not always a clear cut picture, right? But by looking across a large number of data types, we're able to get a more rich, more complete story. And, and going back to my original bioinformatics tools of developing a tool called Mother, or Daughter rather, <laughs> before Mother, um, we've always relied on the generosity of others to make their data open so that we can do these types of analyses. Over the years, we've also engaged in doing meta-analyses. And so in a meta-analysis, uh, one such example is looking at the relationship or association between microbial community structure and obesity status in humans. And so this was an observation that was originally reported by Peter Turnbaugh when he was a student in Jeff Gordon's lab. And so uh, it's been a bit controversial in the field. So what Mark C., a former postdoc in my lab did, was to collect data from 10 different studies. These studies, most of them had nothing to do with studying obesity. But because in their metadata they made height, height, weight, BMI, obesity status publicly available, Mark was able then to go through these 10 studies, study them separately for this question of association between obesity status and diversity to show that, well, two of these 10 studies, did we see a significant effect? As you can see, the effect sizes are minuscule. And then statistically, like a meta-analysis, pull the effect sizes to show on this bottom row that they're overall, yeah, there is a difference in obesity of lean and obese individuals. Is that biologically significant? Eh, I, 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 I doubt it, right? And then when we look at things like ratio of bacteroidetes to formicutes, we see nothing. So Mark then went another step and so, like I mentioned before, that making data available also allows us to do new types of analyses. So what Mark then did was take these 10 data sets and separately to generate 10 different random forest machine learning models to predict obesity status. So for this first one, the first column of Baxter, um, this black circle is the model uh, performance of the model, the accuracy of the model based on the Baxter data set. He then took that model and ran the nine other data sets through that model to assess accuracy to predict obesity status, right? And so what you can see is it's very noisy and we do a really bad job of predicting obesity status based on the types of organisms in these microbial communities. Again, this, this would not have been possible without these PIs making their data accessible and um, making their metadata accessible as well. And, and there were studies that we did not include because Data were not accessible and metadata were not accessible or they were, the data were available, but no metadata was available. Not even the data that would be necessary to reproduce the original work in the studies. They basically checked off the mark, the block, um, saying they made the data available, even though it was completely worthless. And so, as I mentioned, providing the metadata um, is, is just critical, right? If you're submitting sequence data but not providing any other information about it, it's worthless, you're just, you're wasting storage space. And so one effort um, was proposed about 10 years ago, MIMARCS, it's the minimal information about any marker gene sequence. Um, and, and so just for each different type of environment, what is the minimum information that we should be providing to add context to our data? More recently, within the human microbiome field, 
uh, the Storms Checklist was created, which again is a checklist, a tool that we can use as researchers to enhance the utility of our data. And of course, the NMDS has great resources as well for other ways of improving um, the utility of our data. And so what I want to close with is a point of encouragement and a way that we can look forward. So one of the big concerns people have about making their data publicly accessible is that it will allow our competitors to scoop us. Well, first of all, I think you have a five to 10 year head start on your competitors. And if you can't publish your work in that time span, then maybe you, defer, you know, maybe you deserve to get scooped a little bit. I would say if you release your data, you're gonna slow down your competitors, right? Because now they need to analyze their data as well as your data to give more context to their data. This is something that we're not doing a great job of in the microbiome field, right? There are numerous colon cancer data sets out there. So if I publish a new colon cancer data set, I should get in the practice of analyzing it in the context of these other data sets as well. And so I think that will further help move things around long, but it's only gonna be possible if we um, release our data and release our metadata. And so finally, um, whenever awards like this are given, um, I feel like it's, it's Sure, it's to me, it's my name, but it's really the people that have been in my lab and have believed in this mission of open science throughout the years. Um, I remember when we started kind of going down this path, I think people were a little bit uneasy, right? Am I giving away my career? Or are they giving away their career by releasing their data? And I think awards like this, the tremendous citations we've gotten on our work, um, the prestige people hold all my trainees is a, is a testament to the fact that it, it does pay and it moves science forward more so. Thank you all. So I hope you enjoy the talk that I gave to you today, and uh, we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.